Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and wrap up this uh, last session here for the conference. So we are excited here on session 16 to have a discussion about healthcare leadership, and I have some fabulous uh, participants with us today. So I promise that we'll be efficient here. We know we're the last session, and I think we have gift cards we're looking forward to maybe to raffle off here, if I understand things. So more to come here in just a minute. Um, I'm Andrea Mejia, I'm with Piedmont Healthcare, and I get the pleasure and honor of working with patient access operational areas for Piedmont and also the back end customer solutions center, which services our patients both in our professional and hospital locations. So with that, I will let my uh, panel actually introduce themselves. Patrick? Hey, I'm Patrick Wall. I'm the Vice President of Revenue Cycle for St. Joseph's Candler here in Savannah, Georgia. We are a two hospital system with a little over 700 licensed beds um, with outpatient campuses that span across the 33 county region here in Southeast Georgia and South Carolina. Um, I've been with the organization a little over uh, three years and, and came from uh, Northeast Georgia Health System where I was for five years uh, prior to this role. So. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'm Janice Ridling, and um, I have been on the provider side of healthcare for a lot of years. I'm not going to tell you how many. But um, I've worked as vice president for tenant for the Western Division. I have worked at the University of Alabama. I've done both um, physician, hospital, clinic, um, revenue cycle projects. Um, right now, I have my own company. It's Osborne Riddling and Associates. And I have several clients um, that are participating, I think, today. And um, I'm looking forward to getting to know some of y'all, too. Hello, I am uh, Jason Driscoll. I am uh, the Vice President of Revenue Cycle at uh, Lakeland Regional Health System. Uh, that is in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, if you don't know where that's at, that's between Tampa and Orlando. Um, the Lakeland Regional is a 864-bed uh, hospital. Uh, our claim to fame is, is that uh, we're the uh, busiest single-site ED uh, in the country. Uh, seeing over about 225,000 ED visits uh, each year, so. All right, a little request, if we'll move our mics just a little bit closer here. Closer. Be good. Yeah, they want to hear us. Okay. And on video, we have uh, Max. Max, will you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Max Kagan. I am the uh, Chief Financial Officer for Wellstar Medical Group. Uh, up here in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, I look like I'm on the uh, space shuttle, apparently, from what I'm hearing in the room there. Uh, sorry I couldn't make it down, but uh, I'll do my best to be part of this panel. Um, for those of you not familiar with the uh, Wellstar, you know, we're a system that does uh, you know, just right around $4 billion of net patient revenue a year. Through our medical group, we do about half a billion dollars of revenue uh, through our uh, 850 physician FTEs and 450 advanced practitioners. Uh, we're focused on growth. We're focused on uh, primary care access and trying to grow our footprint in the markets that we serve. Because uh, all of us in Georgia are experiencing, you know, uh, the economy that's growing at a very substantial rate, and we're trying to figure out every day how do we serve these communities, um, both large and small. So I'm excited to be part of this uh, panel today. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you all. You know, I think it's important as we're wrapping up this session, we've had a lot of content and material shared with us. We've obviously talked a lot about remote working, COVID impacts, and just the challenges we're at. But I think it's important to remind ourselves where we've been that got us here to the table. So panel, I'd like for you to share what has been your healthcare journey? What really led you to get into this and kind of your experiences that you've had? So Jason, if you'll open us up with that. Sure. Um Actually, I've always wanted to be in healthcare. Uh, since the fourth grade, I wanted to be an anesthesiologist. Uh, and then I uh, took a, uh, a class in high school as my senior year, a little simple accounting class, nothing more than debits and credits. And, you know, and I was like, you can actually make money at this? Uh, I can, sure, I'll do that instead. Uh, I don't get far, too far out of the encyclopedia. I went, you know, architect, anesthesiologist, accountant. So, you know, I, I didn't get past the Bs. So, um, out of college, uh, I started as a state auditor in Texas, uh, auditing uh, hospitals for the Medicaid program uh, out there. 
Uh, did that for about a year and a half, and then I went to the, the better side of life and, and worked for about five years for uh, Ascension, uh, Seton Healthcare Network in Austin, Texas. Um, as, as, as a reimbursement analyst, so I cut my teeth as far as truly, you know, preparing cost reports and, and working on bad debt uh, and DISH. Um, I moved to Sumner Regional Health System uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, was there for three years. Uh, I was over the charge master, uh, governmental reimbursement, uh, as well as uh, cost accounting systems uh, there. Uh, it was a four hospital system. Two of them were critical access hospitals, so there was a lot of fun uh, in playing with the cost reports at that point in time. Uh, moving uh, home health agencies and EMSs away from cost, uh, you know, the, the cause and everything else and, and really uh, exploring that reimbursement. Um, I moved on to, it's difficult to try to come up with what the title of that is. I know probably a few of you are actually from this facility, but uh, it is now called Augusta University Medical Center. Uh, it changed names like six, seven times since uh, I've worked there as the Medical College of Georgia Hospitals and Clinics. Um, so I was the uh, director of managed care uh, as well as the uh, director of governmental reimbursement and I was over to charge master uh, with that. Learned a great deal with that organization, uh, with all of the academic medical center, all the physicians uh, fighting the battles with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia as well as uh, United Healthcare. Um, I moved on from that and uh, took a job as a CFO uh, in, in a small hospital, a 65 bed hospital in Mena, Arkansas. Uh, I was there for uh, a little while, uh, and then some uh, personal issues uh, with extended family forced me to go back uh, home to where I was from. Uh, that's in uh, Mississippi, uh, and I took a controller role uh, there. Uh, so I was more debits and credits kind of guy, uh, and I checked that box, uh, and uh, was there for three years, and then I I've moved over to Lakeland Regional. Uh, as their controller, uh, but I was probably the most unique controller in the country and that yes, I had the accounting, I had the uh, accounts payable, I had payroll. Uh, however, I also had utilization review, I had charge master, uh, and I had oversight uh, of the business office. So it was very interesting, uh, that title, but uh, I was only that for about a year, year and a half, uh, and then I got to a little bit more of a, a traditional role of this vice president of revenue cycle. And so, um, during our time there, we had converted from uh, SMS to uh, Cerner uh, on the RevCycle side, uh, and so that has kept me uh, a great deal busy uh, as far as in, in making that, uh, that system work well. Um, and so leadership uh, from a standpoint of, of all of that, and, I, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, I guess, as we, we progress, uh, but it's definitely challenges as far as in that revenue cycle role. Uh, today because I have physician advisors reporting to me all the way down to, you know, uh, just frontline staff, uh, charge master analyst uh, reporting to me. Uh, and so they all bring their different uh, aspects, different problems, uh, different uh, ways that they view the world. Uh, and so having to uh, adjust uh, on the fly with some of those uh, definitely uh, requires a good bit of management skill as well as a leadership and being able to articulate where the vision is taking you. Great, you've shared a lot of journey in your career. Yes, yeah, yes. For sure. Max, why don't you share what yours is? You're representing, you know, really that physician side uh, with the role that you're in currently. Yeah, um, I started out a, a really long time ago. I worked for uh, an accounting firm that may be familiar to you from maybe an MBA program or BBA program called Arthur Anderson. Uh, I worked there during the uh, Enron days um, and, and before that as well, and I was disappointing in a first sort of career journey that, that really kind of shocked me very early on. I worked in the late 90s up until the firm's unwinding in 2003. Stayed in consultancy for a while, and I did banking and healthcare, airlines, and some, uh, you know, at that point in time, uh, whatever was considered high tech. Um, I gravitated a little bit more towards healthcare on the auditing and financial side and then used that CPA and MBA background and, and got a um, role with an integrated delivery system where I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, called Presbyterian Healthcare Services. They had three lines of, uh, really three lines of business, a for-profit health plan, a large hospital system, and then a large medical group, which was, um, you know, not new to them, they had had it for a long period of time. 
uh, through many leadership roles, I found myself in a situation where I was asked to really sort of clean up financially or help organize the medical group's income statement, revenue cycle, um, how we were going to hold that business accountable and understand how we can, we knew it was important to grow, but we needed to grow it smartly. And so getting into that early on, understanding the, the complexities that I hope you all understand with regards to the rules and regulations on physician compensation. How we build the patient um, in uh, you know uh, in, in the era that we're in uh, today. What we also had in there in that medical group is we were capitated for about 110,000 lives. So I set up a capitation center to um, capture that income separately. We even though that was part of our medical group, we ran that a little bit different than we would our traditional medical group. Uh, I still have this burning desire that I wanted to serve in a large city because I wanted to be on the growth side. Uh, New Mexico is not a, an area that you would look at and say, hey, this area is growing quite a bit, like in Atlanta or like in Denver. So I went up to Denver for a period of time, worked up there, had kind of a similar uh, journey like my colleague over here and had some family issues, brought me back to Albuquerque for a short period of time. And then I've spent the last four and a half years in a leadership role that I'm in now at Wellstar uh, Medical Group uh, and been really proud of the growth that we've had and uh, just really love this part of the country. Met a lot of incredible people. I am uh, blessed to work with uh, a lot of talented individuals that are really all on the same page and trying to improve the way we deliver care, the way we take care of the patients, um, improve and make predictable our financial outcomes. And so what's important to me is that our projections, whether they're short-term or long-term, are accurate. Because if they are, that builds trust and that buys us more time to then really focus on operations and strategy and not so much worrying about living in the windows of the month-to-month -month flows that a lot of us as financial professionals often do. Uh, we've been able to get a lot of uh, success out of our, our projection process through a lot of hard work by a lot of really good people. So um, I'm proud of that. And then, you know, just looking forward to what the next decade um, brings us leadership wise. I'm amazed at all the technology that is out there today uh, that I think is going to become very valuable, not only in the revenue cycle space, but in the uh, delivery and care space, whether that's in the hospital or in our medical groups. And uh, there are breakthroughs that are happening every day of technology just didn't exist 10 years ago that's starting to make its way and gonna make us uh, better, more efficient, allow us to uh, uh, you know, spread our costs and scale a little bit faster than we had in the past. Great, thank you. You know, um, Janice, I, I had the pleasure of working with Janice I want to, we'll admit it, 20 years ago. <laughs> and um, we I was... in kindergarten. Yes, we were. We were in kindergarten. We were. And, uh, you know, I sat in a seat where I was able to admire and learn from Janice uh, during my career journey. And I was very fortunate in that. She actually um, took me through an assessment at the organization that I was at um, and, and making me really understand how to focusing on my operational area and, uh, you know, ask those hard questions and put action plans together and really be exposed, exposed to that uh, kind of at the beginning of, of my journey into healthcare. So I want to tee that up because I, I think Janice definitely has uh, been able to demonstrate that through her journey um, of what she's done for folks in, in her career. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess like Jason, I guess my journey started when I was very young. My first Halloween costume was a nursing costume that my mother had made me. Remember the capes and the caps? Anybody in the audience? Mm -hmm. Y'all are too young? Okay. <laughs> but then I'm, it was more on the clinical side in healthcare. And then, you know, when I was in junior high, there was a nursing home near my home, and I would go after school a couple of days a week and help the staff there bathe patients, feed patients, do that kind of thing. And then, of course, um, when I was in high school, do you all remember candy stripers? Anybody remember candy stripers? Okay, I was a candy striper in high school, you know, again, at a hospital, thinking this is just great. Uh, I graduated from high school, went to college, got my nursing degree, and um, started working in a hospital in, in Florida, in St. Petersburg, Florida, and hated it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
and my mother said, my mother and father said, we're not paying for another degree. <laughs> You're on your own. And then I got married and then I had a change in situation and was home for a while. And then when I went back into the workforce, um, I had met a woman who really mentored me in the financial area. She was at a small 100-bed hospital, and do anybody remember pre-DRG pre days and patients in the hallway and all that kind of stuff? Well, that was the kind of place I worked. And lucky for me, she was um, a great mentor, and she promoted me gradually from the registration, you know, inpatient registration to the switchboard, you know, to have an ER, and you know, some of you may have gone through that same level of um, of moving up through your career. So starting at the bottom and working through till I eventually, um, for that company, ended up as a consultant for them out of Tampa, Florida, and uh, worked out of Tampa, Florida for a long time. And it was in a for-profit setting. It was in a, in a healthcare for-profit setting. And then through the years, I have had some of the best mentors I can even begin to tell you about, both men and women. And so mentoring became a passion of mine. It has always been a passion of mine. And um, I've continued that in the healthcare arena, but I also belong to a woman's organization that mentors women who um, have special needs or um, need some care and some funding to be able to continue their educations. Um, we, own a we own a college. We have lots of uh, women coming out of that college that are going on to get their um, the physicians, master's degrees, et cetera. So mentoring is my thing. And um, like I said, I, I really can credit a lot of mentors for my success over time. So when I moved into this setting where I was going through the financial side of healthcare, learning all of that, the clinical side was very helpful to me because back in that day, you know, what a physician said was what a physician said and we all just jumped and did it, right? So, you know, it gave me an opportunity to be able to discuss with physicians at a clinical level what was going on with the patient and why we might be able to move them out of the hospital, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, I went from there. I worked in the, in the uh, for-profit area for a long time. I had an opportunity to go to where I worked for HCA. I've worked for, um, for HCA. I've worked for Tenet. Um, I had an opportunity to go to the University of Alabama in Birmingham where I um, got my, got my uh, graduate degree at Alabama. A lot of Georgia fans in here, right? I'm not allowed to say Roll Tide? Roll Tide. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, got, got my graduate degree there and then uh, left the University of Alabama and uh, went to Dallas for Tenet, was in, was in Dallas with Tenet. And so I was there for, for five years, um, had a change in situation with my family. My daughter had my granddaughter and in Birmingham. And so I moved back to Birmingham to be with them and uh, took a job at, uh, at Baptist Health System of Birmingham, Alabama as their VP of Revenue Cycle. Um, when you talk about the changes that have happened in healthcare, I mentioned just a few of them, no DRGs, you know, you sent a bill in and they paid you, didn't matter what it was, to what we, um, the risk assessments that we're dealing with now and the changes in healthcare, the environment, and it's just, it's, it's amazing to me to see, you know, from, from whence I come to where we are now and the technology, more technology means less staff, means less expense, which is good for everybody as we're moving through. And, um, but it has been, the um, Baptist Health System was, was a really interesting situation. Um, we had a, a very aggressive entrepreneurial CFO at the hot top of the, um, of the system and they had diverse hospitals, they had 10 hospitals when I went there, and they all were on different systems and they all had their own business office, they all had their own coding, they all had this and that, and he came to me and said, um, Janice, I want you to consolidate coding, business office, charge master, and I want you to do it in, in a month. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's that kind of challenge, and I'm just one of those personalities that's not going to say, no, I can't do it. I'm just one of those personalities that said, we'll make it work. And so we did make it work, and so we consolidated all that. So my last um, provider on, on your side of the street position was I had um, 
the CBO for the hospital, CBO for the physician group. I had charge master. I had medical records, coding, and um, it, it was just really, it was a learning experience. I'd had dabbled in all of that in the past, but really getting down and understanding, and, and you mentioned, you know, dealing with different levels of personalities and different types of people. Um, you, you really have to develop your leadership skills to listen. Really, really listen. And um, I just think that, you know, for me, um, the, my, the secret to my success, which is not a secret, I'm sure y'all do this in terms of your success, and that is hard work, doing, going that extra step, doing that more, saying yes I can, and then um, ethics. You know, we talk about ethics, that's such a critical part of what we do. We manage so much money and we have such a fiduciary responsibility to our employers to manage that appropriately, to collect it so that we can continue to buy technology on the clinical side, et cetera. You all know that story. And then last of all, and I think uh, I mentioned this before, and that's mentors that believed in me, that saw something in me, that encouraged me. And with the staffing shortage we're, we're having today, instead of having to hire from outside, can you not look at what you've got internally, give them an opportunity, not only will that motivate them, that'll keep them there, so them leaving you to go to work for a doctor's office for a dollar more an hour, but um, that also promotes, as we all learn, the healthcare business and finance. Absolutely, all those things. Uh, <clears throat> Patrick, I know that you and I uh, end up having a friend in common through our conversation. It's that reminder, we all have a connection somewhere along this industry, right? I had a little bit of a different experience. I have been in healthcare revenue cycle for a little over a decade and have uh, started at Athens Regional Medical Center, now Piedmont Athens Regional Medical Center as a biller. And um, from there, made my way from the provider side to the um, vendor side in revenue cycle operations into IT and IT consulting and implementations for the revenue cycle um, back over to revenue cycle operations. Uh, like Jason and Janice, I knew from an early age that I, I wanted to be in healthcare. I grew up in a family of clinicians, and so, you know, Sunday lunches in the hospital cafeteria were pretty common. <laughs> and uh, so I knew that that's what I wanted to do growing up. I thought that meant going to medical school, um, but when I was in my freshman year at the University of Georgia and all of those science classes, I quickly decided that I did not want to do that um, <laughs> any longer. So I majored in risk management and insurance and thought that I wanted to go into the insurance side of things. And an internship with an insurance company quickly reminded me that I did not want to be on that side either. So um, I did not know at that age that, and, and I don't think a lot of people that work in healthcare understand that healthcare is a business. And there is an entire business associated with running um, a health system. And so I happened into um, a biller role at Athens Regional directly out of college and didn't really know what that meant or where it would take me. Um, but uh, it, it's gotten me here. Great. So along the way, just to kind of wrap that up, I've had a, a wonderful opportunity and have been extremely blessed to work with and alongside and for. Um, a number of, of great people who have always challenged me and, and reminded me that there's always opportunity in the revenue cycle and that whatever problem or issue or regulatory change that you're presented with, there's always a solution and you just have to find it. So I think that's really shaped my uh, leadership style today. Thank you all for sharing that. I, I think what's interesting is <clears throat> you heard this fast journey of all these individuals, right? and you look at where we are today. And uh, I think we've all faced in our markets, you know, staffing shortages and things of that nature, but I'm not sure it looks like today's environment, right? I think today is a challenge. COVID obviously had some impact to that, but now we've got other things in our world that are going on. So when you look at your organizations, organizations that you work with, what are you doing to address that labor shortage and also burnout that's now coming into our environment? Jason? Sure. Um, from a labor shortage standpoint, uh, you know, we're obviously looking at RPA. We're looking at uh, trying to figure out how is the best way that we can structure things, maybe perhaps uh, differently. Uh, looking at uh, does technology do something for us or, you know, I don't necessarily really want to outsource 
uh, but if, 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 if it makes sense to do something differently uh, because they have the technology, then, then we go that route. Uh, Florida is a little different in, uh, as well as far as that the fact that you know that we have this mandate by the governor to on a rapid pace to get to the $15 an hour minimum wage uh, and so uh, a lot of companies are moving uh, to that 15 or 18 or $25 uh, even uh, even much faster you know there uh, than other places and so we have a significant uh, uh, turnover in, in our patient access area and, and so you know to uh, Gail's point as far as earlier and what they were doing uh, as far as sometimes you can't necessarily just throw a whole lot of money to it you've got to actually make the the the, the employee want to be there uh, you've got to inspire them that they're there to do good work as far as and we're there to take care of the patients take care of the community Obviously, you know, inspiration does not pay the bills, and so obviously that's why we still have uh, the high turnover. Um, but, you know, what we're doing, uh, you know, as far as, you know, we've spent a lot of money uh, on uh, education, trying to make things uh, better, easier, faster uh, from that standpoint. Great. Max, uh, from the standpoint where you are, what are you seeing from a labor shortage, burnout, and those kind of dynamics in your setting? Yeah, there, I'll, I'll handle it in a couple different ways. Uh, let me handle the non-admin or the non-clinical side. So on the non-clinical side, we have been very successful with uh, allowing people a flexible schedule and the opportunity to work from home. Um, anyone on our teams today, our offices are not closed. Um, so we have people working hybrid where if they want to work in our office because that's where they're going to be effective on that given day they can work on that day um my teams for example most of them are working from home and they've been very effective there um the organization has been very committed to equip uh our home workers with the kind of office feel what do they need to be successful at home uh, we've been really good at holding folks accountable and then trying to give that work atmosphere where we're at least meeting once or even twice a week over video, seeing each other's faces, having meeting agendas that are a little bit lighter or they're a little bit longer to allow for some camaraderie that we really, really uh, miss um, uh, in the office setting. And so I think that's been really successful. We've tried to make sure we keep up with market salaries and uh, what changes are going on and what people want in the workplace. I think we, along with everybody else, can compete on wages. I mean, we're not going to go to the top of the market, but what else are people looking at in terms of benefit plans? Uh, what type of work arrangements do they want? So I, I believe that we are gaining the upper hand in the non-clinical uh, areas and producing um, uh, the ability to bring in a, a lot of different applicants from a wide variety of backgrounds. Now, if they're clinical backgrounds, that's a different story. Uh, we're always going to be challenged no matter what the circumstances are with regards to uh, physicians, um, RNs, uh, the, the very, the APPs, the ones that have invested a significant amount of time and, and effort into their education and training. Um, and then for our MAs and our LPNs and our front desk, where we've got wages that can be paid in equal amounts by jobs that are outside the industry that require a similar level of skill. And so it's entered the market, I believe, my belief, uh, we all have different opinions is in the macro market this idea of being able to work from home or have this flexibility has been an incredible game game changer and i'm not trying to sound naive there but if you're making between 15 and 20 dollars before working in a clinic having to drive through atlanta traffic to a job that you're just okay about and now you can move to a job where you can be at home work on a computer um, you know, maybe work a little bit in the morning, work a little bit in the afternoon, but, but for the most part, take care of your family. That person, that group was not a competitor of ours pre-pandemic. Now a whole new group of players um, are in town that are nationally or worldwide that are competing for our talent. So we have to make sure that that work in our um, departments at the hospital or at our clinic is uh, 
uh, you know, unimpeachable and that it's world class and that our leaders need to understand that. And what are we doing every day, making sure folks feel wanted and where they don't want to leave to one of those jobs. And it all starts with the classic, you know, 85% of the reason people leave their roles is for the leaders that they work with. So really doing that hard examination of leaders that we have in place, giving them the right tools and training on figuring out how we can retain um, uh, personnel. And then of course, uh, us as a senior leadership team, we're really focusing on those areas that have the higher turnover and uh, diving in with our HR resources and figuring out what do they need to do to improve uh, their outcome. So, Max, pulling on that thread just a little bit, you know, uh, through this week, we've heard about obviously the impact of remote working and kind of the expansion of our normal marketplace where we got our talent, right? So it's no longer just our communities, right? For some of us, it's open doors where we're now hiring out of state. We're hiring out of markets. Right. And so, uh, you know, with that competition that's kind of coming into play, you know, I think that uh, to Janice uh, reference earlier about mentoring, another word for that internally is succession planning, isn't it? And so, um, you know, Patrick, when you look at your organization, have y'all had discussions about succession planning and what that might look like within your group? We have, and, and I've been fortunate over the last couple of years to build an extremely talented leadership team. Most of them are sitting around that table right there in the center. Um, but we have conversations frequently about succession plans, and, and I feel very comfortable that at this point in time, uh, we've got a succession plan at all levels of our leadership um, for, our, for most of our areas. So we continue to recruit and hire talent that um, we know can learn and grow and be mentored in the organization into those various roles. Uh, we. Uh, have been on a little bit of a journey over the last couple of years focusing around people and process and technology and to Gail's point in an earlier session we had some wonderful talent that was buried in the organization uh, that we uncovered as well as part of that process uh, to help us with succession planning. That's great. You know I'm an advocate of studying the leadership comes out of Chick-fil-A organization. Many of you in the room I'm sure are. And one of the things that they teach is really about betting on leadership, really betting on your people. And it's really about realizing that if you develop within, you know what you're getting. When we all have to interview from the outside, we get through the interview, right? We might get a referral, we may get some networking. And yes, we have the infamous 90 days, right? That we make that match and that is an important period. But when we develop within, we yeah. actually can know their strengths, we can create a journey with them and actually support that career. And actually, it's more economical for us as an organization to promote Absolutely. within. Not only just, uh, you know, from the cost of turnover, right, but just that, that ongoing mission. Um, we heard earlier about the importance of our purpose and our vision and where we're headed as an organization. You don't have to keep reteaching that when you grow within your organization. So Janice, kind of pulling that thread a little bit from a mentoring perspective, any other thoughts on how to help people kind of realize that? Um, well, I think, you know, succession planning is so critical. That's wonderful that you've got that. I think that's just unbelievable. But um, from a mentoring standpoint, as it sounds like you've already done, you identify those people in your organization that you have an opportunity to grow, right? Who are those people? Um, I had a conversation earlier today with a friend, and, you know, sometimes some of those best workers that you have, you have to take care of them. Because what we tend to do, myself included, unless I'm thoughtful about it. And that is that, you know, um, Mary does a great job and she's always there to do anything I need her to do. And she's wonderful, but maybe I'm not paying enough attention to Mary. Maybe Mary's not getting all, because I'm so used to her being the, my right arm or whatever you want to call it, being the one that pulls it all together for me, that I rely on her too much and I don't give her, him or her that kind of accolades, you know, what would I do without you? I thank you so much for doing that. You know, all those things that are meaningful to people, and we forget to do that, I think. I, I know that I have to be thoughtful about doing those kinds of things. So I think that's important. If you're mentoring people, find them from your organization, move them up. I mean, you know, your points are, are absolutely correct. Correct. I, can I say something about COVID? Sure. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about COVID, but I'm going to talk about COVID in just a minute. <laughs> um, 
I just finished with a client in, in New York, and have you all been watching the papers about the mandatory vaccines Yes. in New York? Well, my client has lost about a third of their staff. Wow. And when you see it on TV and in the newspapers, you think clinical, right? No. Mm -mm. It's our staff. Our staff are leaving. Our coders are leaving. Our registration, our pre-reg, et cetera. And I think there's a place for us to look at, even if you're doing something for a six-month period of time where you've lost your pre-off person or your pre-reg person or whatever because they didn't want to get vaccinated um, that, or whatever the situation is, that you do reach out to companies or people that can do fill in for you during those these critical times. That's not a long-term solution. I'm not even saying that, but I do think that we need to expand our our thought process out a little bit to survive this time. This time. So that's all I have to say. No, it's a great point, and I think uh, that'll actually bring us to I think our last question. Then we'll open up for Q and A. You know, one of our jobs as leader is to be strategic, right? We should be looking to the future, right? We drive and we set that for our teams and we're responsible for that for the organizations. So when we think that way, and we think about what is the modern, quote unquote, business office, the modern revenue cycle. What are the things that come to mind for you that will be there and that we need to start getting prepared for? Max? Yeah, absolutely is uh, automation and uh, technology. Um, for a lot of you that work in either, just let's just say delivery systems, doesn't matter if they're small, medium, or large. Um, our leadership, we have the vision that we have this dream that all of our employees are gonna be able to innovate or we'll lean on, uh, and I don't know if this resonates with people in the room, Epic can do that. Well, Epic is doing that right now. We'll just get that and Epic, 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 Epic. It, it, I think there's going to be um, organizations that are outside of healthcare that are getting private equity, that are investing in research and development, taking very smart folks that are solving problems for us, and that they, we're going to end up partnering up with them at some point in time. And these companies are getting, you know, uh, multiples of three, four hundred, even a billion dollar uh, valuations. And that means that they've got a product that works and that it's just a matter of time of being able to create that ROI internally that we ultimately need to hand to our boards and our CFOs when we're making these you know, possibly multiple million dollar uh, expansions. Uh, there's opportunities in artificial intelligence, there's opportunities in how we receive payments from the uh, uh, patients, and it's not so much about we're gonna collect more, because I believe that you know when a patient uh, owes us something that they want to pay that. And some patients will pay us right away and others are gonna pay us over a longer period of time. But if we can reduce the cost of collections over the next few years, that's where we're gonna win. So Wellstar, if we can double the amount of net revenue that we're getting today, and if my revenue cycle colleagues that work on the hospital billing side, the professional billing side, and uh, implement technologies, maybe we don't have to keep ramping up where we run up against the having to hire um, scores of people, we can work with the folks that we have today without burning them out, without any additional pressure. And that's what I see over the next five to 10 years is really focusing on that, that cost of collection as a percentage of overall net collection. Jason, do you see the same or do you say something else in addition to that? I mean, it's it's gotta go to technology because I mean, it's the only way that we really can survive, uh, especially with the, the salaries, the way that they continue to grow. Uh, I don't necessarily care for that because I like to mentor people as well. Uh, I don't necessarily find it very interesting to mentor the software. Um, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> they don't really talk back very well. Um, that might be an advantage. Yeah, maybe. Um, but yes, I mean that. That's uh, I know I've talked to a few folks uh, here this week that that actually have gone so far to have, you know, it, it's their registration process is totally you know uh, almost a virtual type of deal. They they truly are 100% remote. Uh, I, I, we have not gone that way. We still have folks in the ED. We still have folks in the registration area. Uh, from that standpoint, now you know my business office they're fully at home. Uh, so, so trying to 
move to that next step where we actually have registration folks where it was just an iPad and it's very impersonal. Um, I, I don't know that I'll ever, or, or the community that I'm working in right now will ever embrace that, uh, but uh, we, will, we will see what healthcare looks like. Yes. What do you think we as leaders in the operational uh, side of this industry need to do to maybe prepare ourselves for all this technology coming? <laughs> it's a hard one to answer, uh, well, yeah. right? I mean, well, to prepare yourself for technology, as far you one, it goes back to the mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of add on to Patrick's thought a little while ago. Um, I credit most of my career to, uh, or at least the initial phases of it, to, to, to my first boss, who was the uh, director of governmental reimbursement, really, at, at Seton. Um, she wasn't the greatest communicator in the world, uh, but uh, my first evaluation was not good at all. Uh, my evaluation was is that I needed to work longer hours. I needed to put more time in. Uh, I, I had an attitude that I knew it all because I had walked in. I knew how to prepare a cost report. What more did I need to know? Uh, boy, did I not realize how much complicated healthcare was. And she was trying to really open my eyes that I had a huge potential. And like, again, I wouldn't be sitting here today if she would not have raked me over the coals that day. Um, and so therefore, you know, that, that was true mentorship. Mentorship sometimes is as far as telling people how great they are or how to maneuver to, to make their lives better. But sometimes it's telling them you're screwing up and, and you're blowing it. And, and where, I go, where I'm going with this, and I'll land the plane here in two seconds, I promise. But, but the concern that I have is, is that how do you take that person today that is doing a great job at adjudicating that claim? and then showing them the world that they may can live in where they're actually monitoring the system that has done what they have done for maybe 5, 10, 20 years, who knows, but they're actually monitoring that system to make sure that it's working appropriately. Um, and, and, and as I'm sitting here right now, I don't have that vision as far as what that system's going to look like. So how then do you mentor someone to tell them where, what that's going to look like for them in the future? And that, that's my scary part is where I sit today. Uh, you know, you asked the question earlier as far as what does it healthcare look like? Well, and I give you a sort of, I don't know really answer. Um, we, we have to come up with that vision, but the technology is sort of right out there in front of you to whether you want to take that step or not. Uh, as leaders, you've got to, you've got to be bold. Uh, I, I realize that, but you know you've got to sort of play the cards that you're dealt with and lay them down as well you can. So, yeah, no, those are great points, right? I mean, we we're going to have to either transform the talent we have, right, or it may challenge us to have to hire a different talent. I know yeah. we've made a major investment into informatics in our organization recently, right? And those are folks that think differently than those of us who have lived always in operation. They know around us, right, but they can know the various things relative to how the systems work and be able to be that translator with us uh, for our vendors and our IT partners that we have with that. You have final thoughts on that? Uh, just, you know, we've been talking about automation and artificial intelligence for years and I think that that will continue to be the theme for the foreseeable future. Um, we spent the last couple of years um, embracing technology. We've work through processes to install predictive dialers in all of our call centers and patient access and customer service and early out. Um, last year, we automated a large portion of our authorizations. Um, we've uh, implemented new uh, analytics this year. We've got on the roadmap to automate um, our uh, release of information and, and request for information and all of that sort of stuff. But to answer the question on how do we prepare uh, for that, I think it goes back, and Jason touched on this, and to Gail's point earlier, it's about your culture. And um, as part of the changes that we've made over the last couple of years, the way that we were successful is that we focused on our culture. And we focused on building a culture of continuous improvement. And how do we engage the, the team, the entire team, down to the front line in that improvement work. Gail mentioned the huddle process earlier. It's extremely beneficial, and that's one of the key ways that we did that. Um, 
I always used to say for years that, that the way that you manage change in an organization is to always explain the why and make sure you do that at all levels because it releases or relieves the anxiety and helps people understand why you're doing things and if it doesn't work, you're just gonna change it again and that's okay and that opportunities are okay. But I'll tell you, and I've learned this through the huddle process and building this culture, that understanding and explaining the why is always important. But when you actually engage your team and the improvement work and you empower them to become part of the solution, it takes it to a whole new level. And they get excited about it. And they're encouraged. And they perform at the best they can. Yeah, that's great. Great, great points on that. Involvement is definitely skin in the game, right? I mean, where you're headed, really. Janice, thoughts? Um, just, just a couple. I agree with everybody else up here on the panel and probably with you all, too, and that is technology. It's just huge. Um, I was doing so, I do a lot of reading about healthcare, like you all probably do, too. And one of the things that um, that CFO in a CFO survey that I read said that just being able to um, automate with AI your, your uh, pre-auth process through automation that on an annual savings for providers, he's think they estimate it would be $417 million annually if we could automate that pre-auth process, mm. okay? That's a, huge, that's a huge increase. It's got to be automation. Um, and I think the other thing is, and we've heard this word probably ad nauseum, but innovation. We've got to be innovative. And several of the articles I've read lately have talked about innovation being um, how do you keep patients out of the hospital, which is a different, totally different look than what we're all used to. It's like keep them in, keep them in, get those, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, we're entering and have been probably in a very risk environment, a very financially risky environment in, in healthcare. And, you know, now they're coming out with um, systems, again, technology, that can help you um, estimate the risk. What is the risk of this new contract that you're looking at? What's the risk of um, a partnership that you may be looking at in terms of, but they actually have tools, electronic tools for that. So, I mean, it's moving forward, moving forward. And again, like I said, you know, that is such a paradigm shift for me to be thinking innovation about how do we keep them out, right, instead of how do we bring them in. So, I mean, there's a paradigm shift going on here, back to the change, you know, helping your employees understand, because they don't like change, that you have to change. An organization cannot grow without change. Mm -hmm. No organization, not just healthcare. So, you know, how do we move forward? It's a good thing, it's a healthy thing. And um, like I said, I think that providers lose about 2% of their annual net revenue due to operational and claims processing issues. So if you can find technology to help you maintain that extra revenue, even if it's 2%, it's better than, you know, it's, it's still an improvement when you look at your organizations and the millions of dollars or billions, but millions of dollars that you manage. In, in a situation like that. So. Yeah, those are great points. I mean, Thank there you. is a financial cost to all this, right? right. If we stay where we are, That's and there's right. a, there's solutioning coming with that. Okay, um, any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask the panel today? All right. Well, I want to thank our panel today for sharing their journey with us and giving us some thoughts about uh, where we're headed in this industry in the next. So thank you. Thank you.